So it's Psalm 118, starting at 15. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvellous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God and I will praise you. You are my God and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. The second reading is on the front of your green sheet uh, from 1 Peter 2, 4 to 12. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture, it says, see, I lay, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in, me, in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to, to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. We're continuing, obviously, in our series in the letter 1 Peter. And the theme of 1 Peter is living out hope. But hope is not always an easy thing to kind of grab hold of because it's in the future. And so we've been thinking about what is this hope? Well, it's like a candle that gets lit. And that is just a taste for us of, in a sense, the sun. Uh, they're made of similar stuff, but it's such a tiny little glimpse, isn't it, of what is to come. And that is what our hope is, of spending eternity with God in heaven. But it is real, this hope, this candle light that we have now. It pushes back the darkness, and so it changes how we live today. So we are living out our hope. In fact, last week, we were hearing about how our God is a holy God. And our, our hope is to spend eternity with God, this holy God who is uniquely perfect and supremely powerful. 
And so we live now in the light of that as we too are called and enabled to live these holy, set apart, different lives. Because Peter has reminded us, and we even heard it again in our reading, we are exiles. This is not our home. We live for our hope in heaven, our true home. So let us ask God to help us to hear him speak to us again today. Heavenly Father, we do pray that you would open the eyes of our hearts and pour in your light of truth and understanding so that we would know the hope that you've called us to, that we would know the incomparable riches of the inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade, and that we would know the power, the power that is for us who believe in you as so that together we can live out hope and we pray this morning that you would help us to do so, belonging to a house that is fit for you. In Jesus' name, amen. A uh, family bought a bowl at a garage sale. And uh, this is the bowl. Looks kind of ordinary, but uh, they decided, look, we'll put that on the mantelpiece. And, uh, you know, it sat there for a while. But after a while, as you can guess, people got curious about, you know, where was it from? How old was it? How much was it worth, maybe? And uh, sure enough, this $3 bowl at the garage sale sold at auction uh, for $2.14 million. That you call a bargain, okay? Now, I tell you that story because I think that's similar to what can happen with church, with God's people, or as our passage today calls it, God's house. At times, church god's house can be treated like garage sale junk oh yeah put a three dollar price tag on it don't really care don't really value it but today we're being reminded from god that it has a priceless purpose now as we talk about church today or as we understand hear from peter about it and understand what he's saying it's really important that we don't think of church as this building or even the old one out there, or that it's just the Sunday service. That's not what Peter's talking about. It's that, but so much more as we're going to see. How do we value church? See, Peter is writing to encourage Christians, Christians just like us, facing very similar pressures and challenges and discouragements. In fact, those Christians back then in modern day Turkey today are probably feel, were probably feeling the, the rejection of their society, at times feeling like strangers, uh, that they didn't belong, like they were aliens, that they were both invisible and irrelevant to the world around them. I reckon we can relate to that, can't we? Peter is writing to us. God is speaking to us. Now, just a moment ago, we said our creed, and we said we believe in the holy universal church. What did that mean when we said it? Well, today we're being reminded that it is priceless and has a purpose. Today, God is going to open our eyes because sometimes we need it. Maybe actually today you're sitting here and you think, yeah, church is worth about three bucks. That's where you'd put the value on it. Or maybe you've just forgotten over time the value in the busyness of life and things going on and seemingly other things becoming more valuable. Uh, it's possible uh, that you're really struggling to see the value of church because of old hurts or current ones. Today, God is seeking to open our eyes, our hearts, and our minds to the true value of church, reminding us that Jesus is building us into a house fit for God. Just think about that concept. Jesus is building us and others as they're brought in, into a house that is fit for God. That's our big idea that I hope you'll take home today. 
But Peter wants us to see that, in a sense, it begins with seeing how Jesus is building God's house, how it's Jesus who is building God's house. Now, what Peter does is he draws on this Old Testament background of the temple uh, that symbolized God dwelling with his people. It was as if God was in their midst. But then Peter changes it and he says, well, actually, what we're talking about is a spiritual house. You can see that in verse 5. Um, he talks about it as a spiritual house, not a physical place, not that temple, not anywhere, in fact, that can be torn down as the temple would, or even anything that we could build, no matter how expensive it could be. No, no, no. This is something far greater. It's spiritual house reflects the true worth of God. Because in fact, as you might know, Jesus said, I am the new temple. He talked about himself as the new meeting place with God. In John chapter two, Jesus is with, there with the temple, but he actually says, you know, the temple or the meeting place with God, it's going to be destroyed and then rebuilt in three days. And everybody's like, what? You're mad. But in 21, we read, he's talking about himself, which is exactly what he did when he rose from the dead. And so Jesus, Peter says, is the building begins with Jesus. He is the living stone. And we're meant to kind of go, uh, hang on, Peter. I haven't found a rock with a, whole, a heartbeat lately. Uh, it's deliberate to stop us to go, he is a living stone. It's a powerful image. Jesus has risen from the dead to never die again. So he is living, but he is also eternally secure. And so as we read in verse four, if you read with me, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, we are coming to the one that, yeah, others are not going to value. They didn't then, and they will not today, but he is perfect for God's house. He came at a precious cost. This living stone was the one who was hung on a cross. And that's what makes him the first stone, if you like. So we come, we come to the living stone and we are made living stones. Something totally dramatic and incredible takes place all in and through Jesus Christ. Verse five, if you read, he says, you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Let's just keep thinking about this stone image because Peter uses that so that we will understand that we're not just like visitors who walk in and out of this place. No, no, we are permanently built in to God's house. That's how much we belong, he wants us to understand. And that we as followers of Jesus, as, as Christians, we're not just random stones. It's all about us. No, actually, a stone needs the, all the other stones to become a building, doesn't it? And so that is where we truly belong Jesus, with Jesus, Peter says. We are made into God's own house. It's incredible encouragement of a sense of belonging and security and assurance. Uh, we, Cass and I had a fantastic experience of this uh, last year when we visited Germany. Uh, we ended up going to a church and uh, they spoke German. Uh, but before I'd gone, I had just read online that they they had translators. And I'm like, oh, okay, I don't know how that works, but okay. Anyway, we got there and they gave us a set of headphones and there was a guy out the back of the church in a box and he translated the whole service for us, which was a wonderful service. But what it actually meant was we were standing with brothers and sisters of the living stones in a whole other country and we were able to be with them in this house together. And that's what Peter's trying to help us to understand, the significance of this. 
God is saying your identity, your purpose, your home is in my house. So don't listen to the world and don't look at church with the world's eyes because Jesus is building God's house. But this is only possible because Jesus is the rock that divides. He is the rock that divides. In the end, what Peter will say is that Jesus either builds or breaks people. So Peter says he is the foundation stone of God's house for all to build on him. That's why he talks about him as the cornerstone here. Look with me at verse six. It, for in scripture, it says, see, I lay a stone in Zion. Zion is God's perfect heavenly city, not just any old place. A precious, uh, sorry, a chosen and precious cornerstone. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Peter's quoting from Isaiah 28, where God told a rebellious people, Israel, and their leaders, that he would be building a whole new house. Not just an extension, not, not a renovation, uh, trying to tidy up what was there. No, 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 something entirely new and eternal in Zion. And it would begin with this cornerstone. Now, a cornerstone, uh, just in case you're, you're not familiar with that idea, uh, is the stone that a building began with back then. And it was, it was a very large stone. It was a load-bearing stone for the rest of the building. And not only that, but all the direction and lines and straightness, if you like, for the rest of the building came off this corner stone. So crucial. But what Peter sees is this cornerstone isn't actually something that everybody values. In fact, he is a stumbling stone for those who reject him. And Peter says, you know what? This is, this is not a surprise. Way back in Psalm 118 that we had read out to us, there was great rejoicing because God himself would make the very stone that was rejected by others by even the religious leaders, he would use that. And as they read in verse 22 and 23, the Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us re to rejoice today and be glad. But he's saying that, that is Jesus. Verse seven, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, the very one they would have put on the rubbish heap. God has chosen to be his king his cornerstone. But he is a stone, verse 8, that causes people to stumble in a rock that makes them fall. He quotes there from Isaiah 8. Because there will be people who will look at Jesus then and today they will reject him and they too will want to throw him on the garbage heap or in fact, as they did back then, up on a cross. But they stumble. They stumble on this stone because they disobey the message of Christ, which is also what they were destined for. Peter holds for us together two really important truths. Humanity's responsibility in our response to Jesus, but also God's rule and God's plans that he knew and plan for the very rejected cornerstone to be the one that he would build his new church on. Because Jesus is the rock that divides. Uh, there's a story of uh, a, a British naval vessel, quite a large one, one night. It was a dark night, foggy night, uh, going through the ocean waters, and there was a light ahead. And so the admiral of the ship gets on, to, tells his radio operator, uh, let that vessel ahead uh, tell them that they are to divert their, uh, their direction 10 degrees to the east. And so the radio operator does that and the, the response comes back, uh, with respect, we decline. Now, Admiral gets a bit huffy about it and uh, gets on the radio himself. And he says, I order you to divert your direction 10 degrees to the east. 
And uh, the radio operator comes back again, respectively, sir, I decline. And uh, at this point in time, he's like, I am an admiral and I order you right now to divert your vessel 10 degrees to the east. And the re reply came back very simply, I am a lighthouse. Jesus is the rock. Some will build on him and some will be broken by him. He is the rock that divides. And that's why our significance, our security and our satisfaction in this life comes as God's chosen people and priests. It's only found as God's chosen people and priests. Look with me at verse 9. It's one of my favourite verses in the letter. And it's such a wonderful reminder about just how priceless it is to belong to God's church. Verse 9, instead of being those who will stumble and be broken on that rock that is Jesus, he says, but you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who brought you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. This is our greatest privilege and responsibility in life because we've been chosen. If you go back to 1 Peter 1 verse 2, we're told there that we were chosen by God, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son, Jesus. Now he unpacks what does it mean to be chosen? What are we chosen for? Well, he says, now you are royalty. We've been adopted into the very royal family of God, and that is our new status or significance but that's not all we're royal priests now in the old testament this is just totally radical because only one tribe the levites could be a priest there was no other way to get to serve god in that particular way now peter is saying all people jews gentiles whatever are priests it's what we've been chosen for now priests are to bring God to the people and people to God. There's no longer an elite group for this. And as Peter will go on later to tell us that every single believer has a spiritual gift, at least one, to serve God as a priest in this way. We are royal priests belonging to this holy nation, this group of people set apart for God to belong to this people. That is where we find our significance, security, and satisfaction. In fact, God says, the purpose I have done this is that you would declare my praises for bringing you out of darkness and into my light. That's why you and I have been built in to this church. It's so others can come into this house and be built into this house fit for God. This is all Christians he's talking about here are to do this work of praise, not just some. Now, to think about it for a second, to praise something is to just boast about it, talk a lot about it, to be really passionate about it. You know, the things that you bore other people with, I have a few of them. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if you can't shut up about them or other people, you can't shut them up. That's what he's talking about here. It's worth thinking about in the last week. When did you get really excited and talk at length about something? Or maybe what did you post on a social media or share, like, whatever? What were we praising this last week? Well, God's purpose is that we would declare his praises. Because he brought us out of darkness and into his light. He brought us out of death in our transgressions to be made alive with Christ. And so, as Peter talked about earlier in verse 5, we are to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. 
we can't do this ministry ourselves. It's only through Jesus Christ. But what are these spiritual sacrifices that we're offering? It's not killing animals anymore. It's spiritual. It's sharing Christ, praising God, sharing the good news of Jesus. It's loving our brothers and sisters in Christ and serving them. It's praying to God and praising him, not just here on a Sunday in a service, but through the week, you know, as you're driving along, belting out those Christian songs or praying in your room or could just be sharing your thanks to God with others. It's living holy lives, lives that are different, not conforming to the rest of the world. And we do this because, as we read in verse 10, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And isn't that what our world so desperately craves, to belong and to know what it is to be truly, deeply, eternally forgiven? We know that, Peter says. And that is why. We have so much to praise him for. It's through Jesus that we belong as God's people and that our purpose is to be God's priests declaring his praise, bringing God to people and people to God. Now, God's not blind to our faults. Uh, It's not about, you know, have I gotten good enough to do this ministry? No, he's chosen us because Jesus is building us and through us into a house fit for God. How's God been speaking to you today about church? Remember, not just a building, not just an hour or so on a Sunday, but belonging to his house. How's he been speaking to you? I've got a couple of ways that you might be moved, challenged today. Firstly, Maybe you've realized that you've been doing cheap church. That you've kind of been treating it a little bit like that garage bargain that really three bucks worth. You haven't in your heart valued God's house, his church, in the way that you speak about it to other Christians or even people outside the church. In the way that you treat others, you realize you haven't been treating them as living stones part of the same wall that you are attached to. You've been doing cheap church in how you serve. Maybe it's the bare minimum or maybe it's, well, I'm on the roster. Or maybe because you don't serve. I hope today you've been reminded from God that you belong to a a body, a a building that is chosen and precious to God and that you have a wonderful ministry within it. Or maybe God today has been speaking to you because you've been doing fake book church. Not Facebook church, but just similar. uh, Fake book church. I'm sure we've all had that temptation of coming into church looking like we've got it all together. We've got this Christian thing under wraps. We're okay. We're a good person, blah, 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 blah. Or maybe we're we're very conscious of our family looking the right church family look. Kids behaving, kids doing as they're told, looking, doing all that kind of stuff. That's just fake book church. We need to see, as we've been reminded today, that church is, is like a hospital in that all of us are patients and all of us are priests. All of us. Sometimes one more than another, but always both. Because we're all going to fail. We're all going to fail God and others. We're all going to need forgiveness from God and from others. It's all going to, always going to happen. But when we understand that we are patients and priests, that means that we don't judge others. We don't look down like the priests of old or the Pharisees as if we are better. No, we're just another stone bought with Jesus' blood. So we are priests that are seeking to bring healing to one another, God's healing. But also as patients, we need to be careful that 
We don't always remain only as patients and our wounds or our limits mean that we don't serve anyone else. It becomes our identity. Oh, I was hurt back then and that's, that's it. Or it becomes our excuse. I can't do that thing that I wanted to do or I used to do and so I won't do anything now. But instead, instead of staying as a, only ever a patient, rejoice in God's healing that he wants to bring through his word and through others by the spirit and to enable you to serve as a priest in whatever way and capacity God is enabling you today to do that. Applying God's healing hands to your brothers and sisters in Christ as you offer those spiritual sacrifices. Let's not do fake book church. But instead, instead of cheap church and fake book church, let's be priests of praise. Let's live lives as priests of praise. That's God's purpose. That's the purpose that God has given us for our lives. That's why we're told in verse 9, we were brought out of darkness in, into his wonderful light that we would declare his praises. Do our lives do that? Do you look over your last week? Did your life declare his praise? That doesn't mean standing up in the office and singing one of our church songs. I, I mean, you could, but it's talking about things like as good things happen or God's grace happens we talk about that with other people and we say oh I'm so thankful to god for that or as difficult times happening we're saying to other people i'm praying about that in the workplace or out in the world we just keep praising god and, and it begins just with such small and little things but they're what we're called to do this is not an easy thing for us to live as priests of praise and in fact, as we look back on, on church, uh, our, our, I guess our, our momentum, we, we really feel like we're swimming against the tide of our world when we think about sharing Christ with other people. And then we hear God say, no, this is what I've called you to do. That's why our program this year of Prayer for Two is intended to be so helpful and it's so important because we need help. That's why it's about praying because we need God's help. To help us to have eyes to see those around us, to have God bring people into our lives that we can be used to build real, personal, genuine, loving relationships with in order that either we or others might share Christ with them. That's why our big day in is such an important day for you to be at because that's where we're launching and, and getting equipped and encouraged to do this. If we were all happy and, and just fantastic priests of praise, we wouldn't need it. But I know I do. Our greatest purpose in life is God's purpose. And we can be a part of that as we begin praying for two local people to be taken out of darkness and into life as we declare the praises of Jesus, that they would be taken from death in transgressions to being made alive with Christ. As we pray for our two, but also as we pray for everybody else's two, so that the highlands are covered in prayer and people are hearing the praises of him who brought us out of darkness and into his wonderful light. That's how Jesus is building us into a house fit for God and bringing others to join us as living stones. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you for Jesus, the living stone, our foundation. We thank you for building us into your house and uniting us with Christ forever. We pray that you would help us to see how priceless church, your house is in your eyes and that our greatest purpose is to serve in your house. Use us to declare your praises throughout the highlands and beyond, we pray. Amen. On the uh, bottom of the sermon outline, uh, you'll see there there's some questions for reflection um, and it'll be up on the PowerPoint as well. 
I'm just going to give you a little bit of time to do exactly that, to be thinking about some of those questions or thoughts. How has God challenged you, comforted you, and certainly how is God seeking to change you? Encourage you to keep thinking about that through the rest of the day. Write down some thoughts, talk to God. Uh, but right now, I'm going to hand over to George. Thanks, Rob. Great, encouraging and challenging words there this morning. 